Today's message is about something that's very important to you for this next season in the life of this body. And uh, it's called strongholds, mental strongholds. Mental strongholds are, you see them every day. You turn on, you turn on the TV and you watch the news, you will see a plethora of strongholds plethora of them. And you'll know what I'm talking about as I get deeper into the message. But they're basically, basically things the enemy uses, darkness uses, to keep you from perceiving what is truth. They're like a, an atmosphere. They're, they're not demonic forces. You can't, you can't cast out a stronghold. You can only pull down a stronghold. You can't cast them out. They're not demons. They're not spiritual entities. Strongholds aren't like beings that you can, spiritual beings that you can grab a hold of or, or, or anything like that. Strongholds are like the air you breathe, but it's tainted. Strongholds are like, like uh, rose-colored sunglasses that skew the color of everything you look at. The problem is you don't know you're wearing the glasses. You don't like put on a stronghold and take off a stronghold. You, you have them on a, it's like they, they, maybe somebody while you were asleep put contact lenses in your eyes that are different colors. So you take, like, uh, we're driving down the road, my wife and I, in California uh, a few years ago. In the springtime of the year, incredible, incredible view. Beautiful flowers along the sides of the hills purples and reds and just incredible beautiful one of those what they call 100 year blooms they're just spectacular so we're driving along and, and uh, i look at i'm looking and i'm I, I, as we're driving along and i i tell my wife i said honey look at those incredible peach flowers on the hills over there and she goes where and i go right over there to the left hand i mean the hills are covered with them those incredible peach flowers she says they're not peach I said, yes, they are. They're peach. She said, I said, look, I, I can see them. They're right there. She said, I said, come over, lean over my way. Maybe, maybe the windshield is blocking your view. She said, no, honey, they're not peach. They're white. And I go, honey, they're peach. <laughs> Dearest, they're white. My love, they are peach. I know what I am seeing. Honey, I have told you for years you are colorblind. <laughs> and so I've, I've got these sunglasses on. I go, Diane Carol Jackson. They're white. <laughs> They're white. And without knowing it, these sunglasses that I had on had skewed my vision and I was ready to argue over that which was not true but I thought it was that's a stronghold that's that is what a stronghold does in your life so let's take a look at what it says about about strongholds well I didn't bring my glasses up here okay second uh, Corinthians chapter 10 second Corinthians chapter 10 three through six Maybe I have that. Oh, bless your heart. Very good. <clears throat> Says this. For though we walk in the flesh, we do not war according to the flesh. Now, let me just stop right here. Strongholds make you war according to the flesh. They make you fight according to the I know what I see. I was, when I was talking to my wife about those, about those flowers on the hillside, I knew what I was seeing. And I was arguing with her according to the flesh. But strongholds, strongholds, we do not war according to the flesh. For our weapons of our warfare are not carnal, but mighty in God for pulling down strongholds, casting down arguments, and every high thing that exalts itself against the knowledge of God, bringing every thought into captivity to the obedience of Christ and being ready to punish all disobedience when your obedience is fulfilled. Man, now, that's a, there's a mouthful said right there. A mouthful said right there. So we need help. So, Father, 
Help us to understand what the enemy doesn't want us to understand. Help us to perceive, to see what the enemy wants to cloud our vision from seeing. We ask you, O Lord, to help us to pull down strongholds, these mental arguments that we have, that we demand to be right even when we're wrong because we war according to the flesh, but we should be warring according to the Spirit. Help us, O Lord, to learn how to recognize what you are doing in everything. We pray this in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ. Amen. Amen. Paul also says in in Ephesians 4 that we are to put off our former conduct. We are to put off our former conduct. If we, in other words, as we grow and mature, we are not to hang on to that which we used to hold on to. My prayer is that by the end of this message, each one of us will begin to recognize issues that we have that we need to let go of. And we don't need to carry with us after this morning. So what are strongholds then? You can't, you can't grab them. You can't taste them. You can't see them. They're, they're kind of like the wind. You see the evidence of their existence, but you don't see the existence. So you see the leaves blowing on the trees, but you don't see what causes it. You feel it brushing against your face, but you don't see the physicality of its brushing against your face. So you see the evidence, but you don't see the substance of a stronghold. Strongholds are elusive that way. They're attitudes that keep us from embracing Christ-likeness. We feel like we have a right to feel the way we feel. We're justified in feeling the way we feel. We're, we go about self-justifying. We, 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 have to, we become defensive in everything we do. We say, look what they did to me. That's why I do this. Or they don't understand. I alone do. There are areas of the mind where darkness reigns. As a result, spiritual perceptions grow dim. How would, nobody wants to have this said about them, but the Lord said that the children of Israel that wandered in the wilderness had their perceptions darkened. They had strongholds that they didn't tear down. And the result of that was their perceptions, their ability to judge after the Spirit, their ability to recognize what was God, what wasn't God. Their ability to discipline themselves in the light of recognition was gone. Their perceptions were darkened. Strongholds darken your perception. Their system of logic rooted in a lie that we have come to believe is the truth but it's really rooted in a lie. The sunglasses that I had on caused me to see something as if it was true, but it really wasn't the truth at all. They are a habit of justification that forms behind any habitual response, any addiction, fixation, compulsion, obsession, or inordinate fear. My wife had a head-on collision one time. She was driving through our, uh, the area where we lived. It was a winding country road. And a lady that was coming towards her uh, bent over to pick up a, a pin that she dropped. When she bent over to pick up the pin that she dropped off the floor of the car, she kept going straight, but the road curved. And my wife and her had a head-on collision at 40 miles an hour. It knocked my wife's car back 50 feet instantly. I thought my wife was killed. And uh, I got the phone call to come. Your wife has had a serious car accident. You need to get here as quickly as possible. Long and short of that is that for years after that, my wife would cringe every time we went around the curve. Every time. And, And if there was a car coming the opposite direction... That made it even worse. What happens is the enemy wants to use real issues in your life to distort the present. He'll take historical elements that you've gone through, fears that you have from old churches, former marriages, relationships, other pastors, any number of different things. He will take historical issues and superimpose them 
on your current environment. And that distorts what's going on. And what it does, it perpetuates cycles in your life. And you'll find yourself going through cycles, two-year cycles, three-year cycles, five-year cycles, whatever the length of time those cycles may be. You'll find yourself going through the same cycle over and over again, and you'll be tempted to say, why does this keep happening to me? If you find yourself doing that, that is the evidence, like leaves of a tree blowing. That is the evidence of a stronghold's existence in your life. And until that stronghold is pulled down, you will keep going through that cycle over and over again. They are thought patterns that are alien to the Word of God, and they twist Scripture to conform to our own self-serving premises. They are command posts in our lives to which the enemy has access. And that command post starts right here. That's why it talks about Arguments. Where do arguments happen? Right here. Where do vain imaginations happen? Right here. Where do our thoughts begin? Right here. This is what Paul's talking about. So these command posts, the enemy uses these command posts to create misperception on your part. The result is misinformation that enters our thought processes and thereby affects our decision-making ability. These thoughts, these misperceptions enter our thoughts. Those thoughts are what we make our choices from, our decisions from. And so those thoughts enter our mind, they incubate there, and then every decision we make after that point becomes tainted or skewed because of the lie that we perceived as a truth. You may have heard it said like this, perception is reality. That is the evidence of a stronghold. Because it causes you to misperceive. Strongholds are a foothold or a place of access Satan has to us. They're a common ground that we have with him. Now get this. Jesus said to his disciples, I must take leave now or I must go now because the evil one is coming and I have, and he has no part of me. Another version says, he has nothing in common with me. I have nothing in common with darkness. I have nothing in common with Satan. That's, what, that's, what, that's really what we want to get in our lives. We want nothing in common with him. But see, a stronghold says this. A stronghold allows you to walk with God on this side and darkness on this side. And on this side, you have something in common with darkness. On this side, you have something in common with light. But you find yourself torn because you really can't serve two masters. And so you will not be able to remain that way for long. You will head one way or the other. Anything that does not align itself with God's will for you is a, is a place of darkness and it de- and it defines something you have in common with him, with, with evil or with darkness. A stronghold, every stronghold you have is, is a place of darkness in your life or a, something you have in common with darkness. And what the problem is this. It's not just that we have, have it in common with darkness. It's that the commonality we have in, with darkness allows darkness to have access to us. It allows darkness to have access to our lives. It allows darkness to have access to our family. It allows darkness to have access to our finances. It allows darkness to have access to to our, our, our extended loved ones or to our businesses or to our job performance. Darkness enters it. And to the degree we have commonality with darkness, we allow darkness to have access to everything that we're doing. And we wonder why God isn't working on our behalf. Ouch. So he he uses this misperception. They they are perceptions of outward appearances that are based on our mind and our will and our emotions or our soul rather than on the spirit of truth. We judge after the flesh, 
and not after the Spirit. We get upset because something doesn't happen the way we want it, but it's merely because we don't think they should wear that type of dress. Or how could they be a Christian and go to a football game? You watched the playoffs last night? I knew you weren't godly. <laughs> you see, but, it, but in many people's mind, that becomes truth to them. But it's not based on the Bible. It's based on perception. And then sooner or later, perception becomes tradition. And when perception becomes tradition, tradition becomes greater than the Word. And that's what happened with the, with the Hebrew children. Tradition became greater than the Word of God. And they didn't recognize the Word when it came. They were specifically designed by evil to keep us from our God-created destiny. Every person, every group, every church... Every business, every political system has them. They are often thought of as groupthink in these cases or the mob mentality. It is what allows gangs to operate. See, gangs take on a groupthink. Individually, they would not do what they do, but the groupthink, the stronghold, causes that to become the slave driver of the person. And they lose, this, they lose the perception of right and wrong. They lose the reality of what is more important. And it begins with the thought, if I don't do it, they're going to kill me. If I don't kill someone, they're going to kill me. And that's part of the whole process. My life is more important than their life, the person I'm going to kill. That's a misperception. That's a mental stronghold. So fundamentals of how strongholds operate. They are the primary strategy of Satan's work around the world. If you want to, you want to find out strongholds, watch any news broadcast, conservative or liberal, and you're going to find strongholds. Perceptions. Distortions misrepresentations and it's all justified because the end justifies the means that's a stronghold so they form perceptions that distort our perception of everything we encounter they form attitudes and beliefs that keep god from acting on our behalf do you realize that the more you have a stronghold in your life the more you limit God's actions on your behalf, because if he acted on your behalf, he would justify your stronghold. He would reinforce your stronghold. You'd say, I told you I'm right. Look, look what God's doing for me. I told you I'm right. And everybody go, yeah, you're right. We were wrong. And then you get a multitude, and that's groupthink again. They form attitudes that keep us from recognizing God's will and the decisions that we face. Strongholds deteriorate three major areas in our lives. They deteriorate our soul. They deteriorate our relationships. They deteriorate our lifestyles. They prevent, how do they deteriorate our soul, which is the mind, will, and emotions? They prevent or retard our emotional and spiritual growth and the rate at which we mature. They stop or slow down the maturation process. Have you ever met anybody that, was, that did not get spiritually stronger 15 years later? Me too. And it's not a deal of, look who I am and look who you're not. It's a, it's a deal of sudden recognition that creates sorrow in your heart because you realize they have gone nowhere. And it's sad. It, if it's a joyous thing to you, then that's a stronghold. If it's a sad thing to you, then, then that is a spiritual recognition. And it should cause you to pray for that person. I have met so many. I, I can't say so many. That sounds like thousands. That's not true. I have met far too many, I'll say that. People that five, ten years later are no different or are worse than they were before. 
And that saddens me. And it's all because of misperceptions. They, and it slowed the maturity or, they, or stopped the maturation process. Strongholds bring about spiritual disorientation. So you don't know this disorientation because I know it's God. I think it's God. I thought it was God, but it doesn't look like it was God. You get disoriented and things don't happen. They bring, they bring about spiritual disorientation as decision we make prove to be wrong when we expected the results would be good. I've made decisions like that from strongholds. I thought that was God. Convinced it was, especially in my younger years. And it turned out to be me. And the result that came about was the opposite of the result that I anticipated. And it left me not trusting myself to make a choice. See, a stronghold left unaddressed will prove to be wrong often enough that it causes you to lose con confidence that you can make the right choice. And what co comes about there is that you want somebody to make the choice for you. What has gone on in this country for a long time is that people haven't cared about the choices that were made. And they wanted somebody to make, I don't know what to do. I don't know enough about it. I'm going to, somebody make the choice for me. So we elected representatives who made the choice for us. The problem is they didn't make the choice we wanted. They make the choice of their ideology. And now all of a sudden our nation is starting to wake up and go, wait a minute. I better start finding out about this because the choices that they're making aren't exactly the choices that I, that I necessarily wanted. And that's a result of strongholds being in operation in our lives. Strongholds lower the spiritual water table of the nation. The spiritual water table is where leaders come from. Political leaders, leaders of all types come from that water table. The problem is this. The leaders will usually rise, let's just say, 10 feet above the water table. And if the water table's low, then you have low leadership that do not recognize true spiritual choices. They won't make high spiritual choices. They'll make choices higher than the water table, but they're still low spiritual choices. If the water table is high, then the leaders make high spiritual choices. We have lowered the water table in this nation. Fewer people are going to church than at any time in the history of this nation. Right and wrong, it's, it's not clear. You just listen to, listen to what you hear about the political pundits, and you, you go, which is right, which is wrong? One says this, one says this. How do I know which is which? That is the result of all leaders having low spiritual perceptions based on the water table, the spiritual water table they came from. We have to raise that water table. Your pastor and I were talking on the way here. And, and he brought out a, a, a wonderful reality about the Chronicles passage that says, if my people who are called by my name will humble themselves and pray and turn from the wicked ways and seek my face and so on. And, and, and he said, and nowhere does it say that the secular community has to humble themselves. It says, if my people will humble themselves. We kind of, kind of put it out there as a national call. <laughs> it is really a church call. If my people will humble themselves. This is, we have kind of let ourselves off the hook. And not taken personal responsibility for things. And sometimes we make our pastor take responsibility for our spiritual life. And the re reality is, our pastor is not responsible for our spiritual life. You are. When you stand before God, he isn't going to say, well, I know your pastor didn't help you spiritually. 
Salvation is an individual choice. You accept him. It is not a collective salvation. Therefore, no collective leader is responsible for your salvation. So what happens is, strongholds dull our sight and perception and in turn result in our not listening to the spirit or our conscience. They cloud and darken our mind. They imprison our spirit. They dull our spiritual sight, and, uh, which in turn keeps us from recognizing God's will for our lives. And in fact, causes us to not believe we even have a purpose on earth. Embracing strongholds and powers of plans of Satan and his demons while grieving the angels and the Holy Spirit. To the degree you operate in strongholds is the degree of grief the Holy Spirit has for you. Because you integrate strongholds into your life, you give strongholds permission to operate in your life and open doors for darkness. How do they destroy or deteriorate relationships? We talk about the soul. The second thing is relationships. They provoke jealousy, envy, strife, anxiety, and depression in you. They provoke you to respond to others in ways that even you don't understand why you responded the way you responded. They fragment attempted friendships, and they steal our sense of love, joy, acceptance, and overall well-being. They allow us to give begrudging love at best. Love with strings attached. They distort the offense to make it seem larger and more painful than it actually was. They cause us to see intent to hurt where there was no intent to hurt you at all. They keep us from forgiving others. And they are the major cause of bitterness growing in our lives. They cause conflict, separation, divorce in marriages, and in the church they cause division and church splits. There's never, ever been a church split that didn't begin with a stronghold. And then strongholds open the door for demonic activity. It's kind of like cancer. Cancer grows best in certain types of environments. And if cancer was likened to demons, then the environment would be likened to stronghold. And so... I have a friend who's an oncologist. He's, he's doing some secret work in the UK. He literally, his lab is literally 18 stories underground in, in England. I won't even tell you where. In England. And uh, he told me, he said this. He said, uh, he's one of the two oncologists the World Health Organizations listen to. Two. Out of all the oncologists in the world, he's one of two. And he told me this about cancer. He said, you know what cancer grows best in? He says, you know, and I use it in all my Petri dishes to grow cancer cells to find out how to eradicate it, change it, so on. Cancer cells grow best in margarine. (laughs) Oy vey. (laughs) Margarine. So you can kind of like put margarine is like a stronghold, and it invites cancer cells to grow. When you leave strongholds active in your life, you're inviting demonic forces to come. To influence you, to operate negatively. I'm not saying possess you. I'm just saying to oppress you. To overshadow you, to lurk in every corner. And then things get even worse. So, lifestyle, so they cause us to see intent where there's no intent. They cause off, there, there can be no offense without a stronghold. Do you understand? You can never be offended with anybody without a stronghold being there. And to the degree of the emotion in your offense. It's the degree the stronghold has rooted in your mind. I know some of you are going to like, I don't like this. <laughs> That's the stronghold. <laughs> <laughs> it's losing ground and it doesn't like losing ground. 
if the thing that keeps churches from growing is strongholds because they keep people from making decisions that which keep people from taking action which make people not have commitment which allows people to to do whatever they see is right in their own eyes and there is no direction that they will follow and so everybody is working on their own and there's no unity which God wherein God commands a blessing unity is the result of strongholds being pulled down till strongholds are pulled down there is no unity to build a vision and the vision from God can exist and it can be clear and yet nothing happened because the people have not pulled down stronghold. You read about Jehoshaphat in Scripture. He did what was right in the sight of the Lord. He followed Af- He didn't follow after Ahab, but he followed after David. He did all the things that God wanted him to do. And Israel began to prosper to some degree, but it goes on to say, he says, but it did not totally prosper because the heart of of the people had not yet been set to serve God. Jehoshaphat did everything God asked, implemented the vision that God asked, and yet the people did not have a heart to serve the Lord. We think it's the pastor's issue. It's not. Yeah, there is is something your pastor has to do. I have to do in my ministry. Other pastors have to do everywhere. That's, that's no getting around that. But you know what? The pastor could do everything God says, but if the people don't have a heart to work, nothing's going to happen. Nehemiah built a wall, and God said to Nehemiah, I'm going to put it in their heart. They're going to have a heart to work. David, God said to David, in the day of your anointing, the people will have a heart to work. Strongholds keep the people from having a heart to work. They weaken our bodies. They keep us from accepting others and what Christ created them and us to be. They disguise cycles of failure so we don't recognize the repetitive nature of our mistakes. You see, if, at least if you said, why does this keep happening to, to me? You've recognized a cycle of failure. But once the stronghold gets so entrenched, you don't even recognize why it keeps happening to you. You don't even recognize it's a cycle of failure. You even lose that perception, that sensitivity. Your perception becomes so darkened. They encourage the victim mentality. So we blame others for our problems, our failures, our life circumstances. And in doing so, we further lose the ability to perceive our patterns of error that we walked in. Strongholds produce, at best, distorted or partial obedience to God's directions. So how do we kill or pull down a stronghold? How do we get rid of a stronghold? Well, let's see what the Scripture says about it. What you cannot do, I have mentioned earlier, I'm going to repeat this. You cannot cast out a stronghold. You stronghold, come out. That ain't going to work. But you can pull down a stronghold by the power of the Holy Spirit of the living God. And that's why it's so important. Jesus said in John 14, this spirit is with you, but he shall be in you. That's why it's so important. See, with the Holy Spirit in us, he, if you give him permission, will drive out, pull down strongholds. He will get rid of them. And he will tell you what you need to do to do that. So you can pray and ask the Lord to do that. Ask him to remove these strongholds from your mind, these patterns from your mind, these misperceptions from your mind. You can, to, when you take a look and do a word study on the, on the phrase, pull them down, it means demolish them with violence. In other words, don't stop until they're gone. A word stronghold literally means a castle or fortress from which one argues over his possessions. So strongholds cause you to argue 
over your possession. Now, your possession may not be a car. Your possession may be an attitude. I deserve to feel the way I feel because they did what they did. Well, you're the one getting acid reflux from it. <laughs> not them. Not them. I got a letter a while back from, from, a, from a, a young man, and he says, I forgive you for what you did to me. I have no clue what I did to him. I didn't, didn't know the young man. I had no idea. <laughs> I forgive you for what you did to me. And I looked at that. This is good because at least acid reflux stops in his life. Because I had no clue. It didn't bother me a bit. I wasn't like worrying and fretting because I, I, I still don't know who the young man was. But some, apparently I said something in a tape or, or something that he took, took offense to. And, but at least he forgave me. That means a stronghold came down to some degree, came down. So, but he, and so we argue our, over our possessions, our attitudes, our, our opinions. Uh, we cast down our, our arguments. That means our computations, our, our ability to, to finagle things in our mind and self-justify why it's right that we should feel this way. We are to take our thoughts captive. It literally means as one would a prisoner of war, like how you treat a prisoner of war. You take them captive. You don't let them continue to go because they will harm you. So we take our thoughts captive, those intellectual disposition, the intelligence that we have. We do this to the obedience of Christ, meaning submission or compliance. Now, this is interesting to the... To the obedience of Christ, there's two forms of obedience. Did you know that? Two forms of obedience. One is simply called obedience. The other is called submission. Obedience and submission. And we can be obedient without being submissive. Jesus was obedient to the point of being submissive. He submitted himself to the perfect will of the Father. I don't want to do this. My soul says, don't do this. I, my soul is exceedingly troubled, but for this purpose I was brought into this world. I will do this. Father, not my will, but your will. That's submission. Okay? Now, submission. Submission is, is what happened when the, kings, the king of Moab and the Israelites were fighting each other. And, and you read about this in... in, in uh, I think it's First Kings three. Or, um, the king of Moab it, it takes, and the Moabites are losing, about to lose their city. Israel has marched to the land and conquered all all the cities. And now we're at the final place where the king of Moab is. King of Moab takes his son, burns him on the wall, and and he was the next one in line to be king. And he burns his son on the wall as a burnt offering, alive on the wall. And Israel is defeated. How did this happen? Simply this. The Moabites were, sub, were more submitted to their God than the Israelites were to their God. And there's only one God. Don't get me wrong. There's not like two gods fighting out here. That's not what I'm saying at all. But God is whom you serve. Doesn't make him God, little g God, not big g God. Okay? So... The Moabites were more submitted than, to their God than Israel was to, to their God. What do you mean submitted? Okay, you've heard the, heard the story about the child who's eating breakfast, stands up in his high chair, and the mother says, sit down on your high chair and eat breakfast. And the boy says, no. And so the little boy, uh, the mother says, I said, sit down on your high chair and eat your breakfast. No. The mother walks over to the boy, picks him by the shoulders, grabs him and says, now sit down, son. And eat your breakfast. And the boy turns to his mother and says, I may be sitting down on the outside, but I'm standing up on the inside. And that's the difference between obedience and submission. Obedience, you can do it. Submission, I'm glad to do it. God, God loves a cheerful giver. What's the difference between a giver and a cheerful giver? One is obedient, one is submissive. Obedience, 
I don't want to do this. I'm going to do it, but I don't want to do it. What do you mean give 10 more? I don't want it. 10 more. What am I going to eat lunch with? Give 10 more. I don't. <laughs> okay. All right, here. Here, take it. Obedience. Submission. This is going to help. Well, God, there's 10 more. Okay, if they need 10 more to make this thing happen, I'm going to do it. Thank you, Lord. Boom. Submission. Nowhere does it say God loves a giver. Amen. Boy, by the time I'm done here today, <laughs> I'm glad I parked my car facing out. Now, here's the part that we don't understand. Paul goes on to say, I'm going to read this again. In verse 6. And being ready to punish all disobedience when your obedience is fulfilled. What does that mean? It simply means this. To the degree you're obedient, God will act on that which is trying to destroy you. When you have fulfilled your obedience, God will act to destroy what is trying to destroy you. Then the opposite must be true. If you are not obedient and you do not try to pull down these strongholds in your life, then God cannot act on your behalf and be justified in doing so. What justifies God acting on your behalf then is your obedience. Your obedience. You want God to act in your business? Then obey in other places as well as your business. You want God to move and keep, and so that you keep your job? Then obey in every area, and God will act on your behalf. And not only that, he will tear down that which seeks to tear you down. He will destroy that which seeks to destroy you. He will hold back that which seeks to overcome you. He will act when your obedience is fulfilled. See, we get it wrong. We get thinking, well, God, if you will do this, I will do this. God says, no, 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 no. If you'll do this, I will do this. Well, how do I know that you'll do that? Because I'm God. Because it's part of faith, son. And if you don't have faith for this, how will you have faith for the things that are really important? Or as God said to Jeremiah, if, if running with the footman has wearied you, what will you do in the day or the horses. If you've been wearied in this small thing, what will you do when the greater thing happens? That's, this, is what, this is what strongholds try to do. They keep you from being obedient because you misperceive it. So God can't act on your behalf because when you hear God tell you to do something, you literally misperceive it as being the enemy and not God. And therefore you are not obedient because you've lost your sensitivity to what the Holy Spirit of the living God asks. And we don't think that we can do that, but we can. And it happens every day. Why is this important to your church? Why is this important to River of Praise? Because this is what God, God is preparing something for you that it will take submission to accomplish. The obedience of Christ is not just obedience. It is submissive obedience. It's not mindless obedience. It's not lack of, it's not lack of questions. No words to say, don't, don't ask questions to help you understand. That's not what I'm saying. But there is the edge. 
See, you can always tell when a stronghold exists because anger is the fruit of a stronghold that disagrees with, of, of a person disagrees with your stronghold. Anger is the fruit in you. When somebody doesn't do what your stronghold says, your stronghold causes you to become angry. To the depth of your anger, that's the degree of your stronghold. And it's not just about issues in the church people. It will affect every aspect of your life. Your job, your marriage, your parenting, your finances, your relationship, your home. It will affect all of those. So, Father, I pray this day that these people will take this word and apply it to their life in your name. Now, probably none of you have this problem, but if you do, here's something I'm going to ask you to do. Here's what I did. I put my hand on my head, and I just begin to say, I pull down the stronghold in the name of Jesus. I will not, ha this will not stay in my life. The Holy Spirit is going to reveal to me what needs to come down. I will resist this. I will pull this thing down. It will not stay. It will not find lodging. It will have no place in me. In the name of Jesus, it just is not going to happen. By the power of the Holy Spirit, he will sweep my house clean. So if that's, if that's you, I'm going to put my hand on my head, and you can join me. Don't put your hand on my head. There's not room for all of your hands. <laughs> but you can join me and put your hand on your head, and we're going to ask the Holy Spirit to come and start demolishing these strongholds. So stand with me, and we're going to do this. Now, if you don't have one, don't, don't worry. It's, then if you don't have one, sit there and pray you don't get one. <laughs> so repeat after me. Father in heaven... In the name of Jesus, by the power of your Holy Spirit, who dwells within me, search me, try me, see if there's anything in me that resists your will, that distorts my perception, that keeps me from being obedient to you. And I ask you, Father, by the power of your Spirit, to reveal these things to me and give me the, the strength and the courage to address these matters. Even if I've made friends with them, I resist this. I will pull these things down. I will give them no lodging in my mind. They will have no place in my heart. I want your perfect will. You've designed me for today. I am here by your choice. I have a purpose to accomplish. And I will not allow these strongholds to keep me from walking in you and fulfilling your purpose in my life. I will become submissive to you. And these strongholds will be torn down this day. And I will be faithful as you address every one even if you address it next week or the next week, I will pull them down as you bring them to my attention. In Jesus' holy name, empower me to do so, Father. Amen. Amen. Yay. All right. Lord's great. And He is going to accomplish that in you because He really does have a wonderful plan for you individually and for this body of believers corporately. He has a, an incredible plan that He wants to create a seismic activity here, a spiritual seismic shift here. And when He finds a body unified to do it, Again, it takes removing of strongholds, but when he finds the body unified to do it, he will act immediately to begin to bring it about. He will not delay. When he finds individually in you, when he finds you agreeing spirit, soul, and body 
as Paul, 1 Thessalonians 5.23 said, would that you be sanctified, spirit, soul, and body. When he finds you unified within yourself, not judging after the flesh, but after the spirit, he will immediately begin to act on your behalf as well. Individually and corporately. There's the individual body, there is the corporate body, and both have the same dynamics and spiritual principles of how God operates. So, Father, bless all these people. May they go in strength from glory to glory in your holy name. Amen. God bless all y'all.